Hey folks, today we're gonna to be depositing metal onto glass using a fiber laser. The process is dead simple and it worked for most metals that I had sitting around the shop. I'm not sure how useful it is in practice to be perfectly honest, but I figured I'd share in case it was interesting to anyone else and maybe you'd find an application for it. So this is actually one of those happy little accident sort of techniques. I was attempting to weld together thin sheet metal, uh, like shim stock foils, uh, and it works, but it wasn't very consistent. So I was attempting to improve the consistency and reliability of the welding process. I tried clamping the shim stock between two pieces of glass, just glass slides, and the idea was to help improve the contact between the metal by kind of squeezing it together. And it helped a little bit, but I found that what it actually ended up doing more reliably was transferring the metal onto the glass. I've seen this effect before when playing around with the laser, but for whatever reason, this particular set of laser parameters and metals that I was using was really reliable and consistent. So I've successfully transferred aluminum, copper, titanium, silver, niobium, indium tin oxide, and INVAR 36 to glass, and it seems to work pretty reliably. I did try zirconium as well, but it didn't really work, and we'll see that in a bit. It probably works for just about any metal that a fiber laser can ablate. So anything that's susceptible to the 1064 nanometer wavelength probably will work fine with this technique. The transferred aluminum is reasonably conductive, and you can even weld large pieces of metal directly to the glass if you're not careful. The copper isn't terribly conductive, but it is conductive enough that you can electroplate a thick layer of copper on top of it and then use that for soldering. But that's getting ahead of myself. Let's stop and take a look at the setup first, and then we'll explore all the different metals and their properties. So the metal of choice is sandwiched between two glass slides and clamped into place. I just use like binder clips. The laser is focused on the metal surface, shooting it through the glass slide. And then you just etch the metal. The laser pulses ablate and remove material from the metal, and that kind of ejected material it immediately impacts the glass slide where it's deposited into a thin film. We'll look at some of these test runs under the electron microscope later because, well, one, it just looks really cool. And there's also some interesting observations about what's going on, like what's the mechanism of action in this process. The laser parameters themselves varies depending on the metal, because some metals are more or less reflective at this wavelength, but generally I found that a modest speed, slower pulse rate, and medium-ish power was the optimal strategy for this kind of technique. Some metals are very different though, so you will probably just have to play around depending on what metal you're working with. Silver, for example, I found was most effective at a 200 kilohertz pulse frequency, which is almost like a constant power laser instead of being pulsed. This clamped setup works really well for fine lines and patterns, but I found it wasn't super effective for large areas. The heat buildup tended to just kind of etch and crack the glass. So instead you can introduce a very thin standoff, like take some of the shim stock, 200 microns, 10 thou, something like that, and leave just a really tiny air gap between the glass and the metal. I found that this protects the glass from kind of heat induced damage and it lets you deposit very large areas of metal. The downside is that because there's a bit more of distance, the, the metal plume that's ejected upwards has more time to spread out. So you get blurrier lines. So it's not really great for patterns, but it's better for kind of large blocks of deposition. I didn't try this, but in theory, you should be able to deposit a large block of metal and then flip the glass slide over and etch it back off with the same laser. So there's probably a middle ground there where you mix and match techniques. Of all the tests I ran, silver definitely had the best conductivity uh, and it had a pretty wide process latitude. So a variety of parameters would give you a good metal deposit that was conductive. I did find that depositing large blocks of metal using kind of the standoff technique was a little more variable. Uh, you can see sections in here that are pretty grayish, and that's just oxidized silver, and it has poor to no conductivity, while other sections retain their, you know, silveriness, it's not fully oxidized, and those are pretty conductive, so there's a bit of variability there. Aluminum was pretty reliably in the milli-ohm resistance range, regardless of the different parameter set. Uh, so it was never quite as conductive as the silver, but it also gave you pretty much consistent results no matter what. I never achieved good conductivity with copper and some of the samples were like downright insulating. 
I'm assuming we're just generating a ton of copper oxides here, a lot like we did in the DIY image sensor video, except not on purpose. <laughs> but because copper oxidizes so easily under heat, and you convert into copper two and copper three oxides pretty readily, I think we're generating a pretty substantial semiconducting or insulating layer here. But some of the better samples are conductive enough that you can electroplate on top of it. So I grabbed a bottle of random electroplating solution off my shelf. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember the chemistry here is from some old experiment. So these are not the best results, but it did form a pretty thick copper layer on top that was very conductive. Using like a proper electroplating bath and a little bit more process refinement, I think you could get a really nice coating with this technique. It's also thick enough that we can use solder paste and solder surface mount components directly onto the glass, which is uh, pretty cool. Adhesion seems pretty good. I mean, just from poking at it with some tweezers, uh, the resistor didn't pop off immediately. I didn't try too hard because I didn't want to ruin it, but I think this is a pretty decent technique and it's not going to immediately peel off. I did try soldering to the silver samples directly without any kind of electroplating step and that just didn't really work at all. Um, to be honest, in retrospect, I don't know if you can use thermal paste on silver directly, so it might have been a failed experiment from the start, or it might just be because the, the layer is so thin that there's not enough for it to really grab onto. I don't know. Indium tin oxide was an interesting test and only kind of successful, to be honest. If you're not familiar, ITO is used as a transparent electrode on things like uh, LCD displays or touch panels, you know, stuff like that. Something you need to look through but still have it be conductive. But despite the thin film being transparent, bulk ITO, like if you had a block of ITO in your hand, is actually a really dark gray material. And I found that it absorbed the fiber laser wavelength way too well. <laughs> it was actually too susceptible to ablating. So essentially, even when I dialed my laser down to its absolute minimum power and increased the pulse duration up really high to try to reduce kind of the peak pulse power, uh, it was still ablating too much ITO and we're getting a really thick deposit on the glass slides. Resistance ranged anywhere from mega ohm to kilo ohm, which is like not great for ITO. Uh, one sample did get reasonably low, but it was also the most non-transparent of the batch. Like you can see through these, but they're not clear, nice, transparent deposits like you'd expect from ITO. So this one was a bit of a bust. I tried titanium and it was pretty fun. Some parameters deposit a nice metal film, while other parameters are clearly oxidizing very heavily and giving us kind of a, a rainbowy titanium dioxide film instead. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I couldn't really get zirconium to work. It always seemed to leave a bluish zirconium oxide film that was completely non-conductive. Invar 36 and niobium both appeared to deposit pretty well. I don't have a great method to assess their quality, but it left metal on glass and it was like conductive enough that it seemed to have worked. So let's take a look at some of these samples under the electron microscope and we can maybe start to figure out kind of the mechanism of action and if samples specifically like the invar and alloy retain uh, their alloyness or do they separate into multiple components. So let's start over with silver because it was the most conductive and I'm curious to see what that looks like. You can immediately see that the deposit of film is not a clean continuous layer. It's actually like thousands of small blobs of metal splashed around like paint. This pretty definitively tells us that the mechanism of action, what's causing these thin film deposits, is not a plasma process like sputtering, but rather a molten droplet process. If this was a plasma process that was generating metal ions that then adhered to the glass like a sputtering machine, we'd expect a really consistent thin layer. Or even if it wasn't consistent, if it was blotchy, we'd still expect the, uh, the character of it to be very finely grained metal that's been deposited. Instead, this is like very obviously molten droplets that are impacting the glass surface and then solidifying quickly to form a metal film. We can also see small micro cracks in the glass slide underneath the metal droplets, which kind of also confirms that it's a hot molten metal process. 
All of the other metals are essentially the same, just with different amounts of splashing and morphology to their splashes. The shapes and size of the droplets varies depending on the metal, which you kind of expect based on different melting points, but in effect, they're all doing the same thing. The two exceptions, however, are titanium and invar. The titanium samples tended to show this sort of like foggy, diffuse background, and then comet streaks, where the molten droplets look like they kind of rolled across the surface. If we turn on the element detector on my microscope, we can see a faint background of titanium everywhere, not just on the comet streaks. There's also a ton of oxygen, so this could be titanium dioxide, but it's also likely just the oxygen that's in the glass slide itself. Titanium is super reactive though, so my theory is that the titanium is being ablated upwards and then rapidly converted into a cloud of titanium dioxide, which coats the surface and causes this foggy diffuse layer. Any molten drops that are large enough to make it to the surface impact the TiO2 surface layer, kind of roll around a little bit and collect some of that oxide, leaving behind these comet streaks. I'm not sure if that's what's happening, but we only see this with the titanium, not with the other metals. So it's something specific to titanium and not just like a contaminant or a process that happens with the glass slide. The other metal that I found interesting was the invar. So invar is an alloy that's predominantly iron and nickel. And then there's a small percentage of different metals just kind of in trace amounts. Under the element detector, we can see blobs that are enriched in both nickel and iron, as you'd expect, but we can also see a diffuse layer of aluminum, which does not co-locate with the nickel iron blobs at all. Aluminum is only supposed to make up at most 0.01% of the alloy, so a really tiny amount. But I saw this consistently across many tests with the INVAR. So I think what's happening is that the very small amount of aluminum is separating from the alloy as it melts and being deposited as kind of a distinct layer from the nickel iron blobs. Either that or it's some kind of aluminum contamination which is depositing, but similar to the titanium, I only saw this with Invar and I was using the same glass slides and parameters elsewhere and we didn't see a thin aluminum layer. So either there's a contaminant on the Invar itself, like a thin top coat of aluminum, which doesn't really make sense, uh, or it's the alloy that's separating a little bit. And I think that's a more reasonable explanation given the low melting point of aluminum compared to iron or nickel. Ultimately, I don't know, but I think it's a neat observation and it's potentially a warning that this process might not work well with alloys. Once you get multiple metals that are alloyed together, the process of melting them could de-alloy the metal, right? Everything could start to come apart as it's molten and flying to hit the surface. So that would definitely need more testing. Try some more common alloys, different steels and stuff rather than Invar, which admittedly is kind of an odd one. Unfortunately, I ran out of time and didn't test any other alloys. As I think you can tell from the background, I'm not currently in my shop. I'm actually moving cross country at the moment and uh, the fiber laser is no longer with me, <laughs> so I had to kind of cut this experiment a bit short. I do have some ideas for improvement if anyone wants to try this out at home. The most obvious and easiest thing to do is add an inert gas to help reduce some of the oxidation. I think it would be really easy to build, I don't know, a small containment chamber or even just a nozzle pointed at this setup that is nitrogen or argon, something inert to keep the oxidation pressure down. And I think you probably get much better samples out of uh, the aluminum and the titanium and the copper in particular. And as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty easy to deposit large areas of metal, just like a big square, not patterned or anything. And if you can keep the oxidation down and make sure that's a really nice film, it's probably easier to deposit a large layer, flip them, slide over, and then etch off the pattern that you're interested in, rather than trying to draw the pattern directly from metal onto glass. Hey, so I totally forgot, if you are in the Bay Area in July, July 18th or something, I don't know, I'll put the dates on the screen. Uh, come to Open Sauce. I'll be there, a bunch of other YouTubers will be there. It was a ton of fun. Uh, I went last year, here's my shirt from it, and I had a great time. Uh, talking to folks was really fun, there's a lot of interesting people there. 
uh, and a ton of really cool projects, like an overwhelming amount of creativity and technical knowledge all kind of packed into one place. So I really enjoyed Open Sauce. I thought it was a really great time. Uh, it, looking forward to this year sometime in July, like I said. So yeah, if you're there, check it out. Uh, and otherwise, here's where I've been living for the last month. It's a little Airstream. Uh, five out of 10, do not recommend. Okay, that's all I got. Peace. Anyway, this was just a fun little tangent to a diversion to packing because <laughs> I was getting tired of packing up my shop. Uh, I hope you found this interesting and next time I'll probably be somewhere new. Thanks for watching and I'll see y'all later.